Okay, thank you for joining this edition of Mel Talks. Our speaker tonight is Andrea Figueroa, who's a co-founder of Miel Nativa, a social enterprise uh, organization here in the Yucatan. Um, I'll have, we'll have a little bit more about their company later and she'll talk about it, but I can tell you they have a shop in the Plaza Carmese, which is at, um, CAE 53 and 62, just a couple blocks from the library. Uh, that's the same plaza that has um, the Between Lines Bookstore and Volta Cafe. In addition to the Miel Nativa site uh, um, shop, they have a couple other <clears throat> organizations in there with them, including uh, Asica Sociedad, if I said that right. Yeah, um, a, a company that sells fine handcrafts and the, re, the uh, profits from that go towards supporting children with Down syndrome. So there's several very um, worthwhile enterprises in that little plaza, that intersection. We've kind of entered the makeup session of Mel Talks for this season. Uh, we were supposed to have this lecture a few months ago, but the uh, COVID struck both Andrea and her co-founder, Rodrigo Navarro. Uh, next week, David Aldridge will talk about his life as an artist that's also been delayed for COVID reasons for a couple months. And then we'll conclude the season, the second week of April with uh, Reg McGee talking about uh, continuing his series on the Mexican Revolution. Uh, this speech, this talk is gonna be entirely on Zoom. Uh, Reg's speech will be entirely on Zoom, but David's talk next week will be in person at the library starting at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Andrea, and you can take it away. Thank you, Scott. Well, thank you, everyone that's um, joining uh, this conversation. And um, to start, I would just like to play a video. So you, if you don't um, already know our company or me or Rodrigo, um, you have a little bit of an introduction, introduction of us and what we're doing. And then um, we can start chatting about like bees and why, why should we care and um, what can we do, right, to help. Okay, so I'm gonna play these. Figueroa. Yo soy Rodrigo Navarro. Somos fundadores de Miel Nativa Cabana. Cuando empezamos a construir el proyecto, nos empezamos a dar cuenta que no podemos proteger algo que no conocemos. Entonces, lo primero era informar a la gente y a todos los niveles de la cadena es darle información a los productores que les sirviera para poder negociar con los intermediarios en términos de igualdad. Pero también era hablar con el cliente final, con los consumidores, para que ellos tuvieran información que les permitiera tomar mejores decisiones a la hora de consumir. Mi nombre es Ben, a mí me Wan Yam. Soy de aquí, de la comunidad de San Ángel. Pues soy meliponicultor desde hace alrededor de cinco años. Me encantaron estas abejas, llegaron a mí, llegaron a mi casa. Empecé solamente a, a colectarlas, a adoptarlas, pero no sabía yo qué enemigos tenía, cuál es la forma de cuidarlas. Apareció una oportunidad para aprender sobre abejas meliponas. Y de una vez no, no lo pensé mucho. Algo que desde mi experiencia pude notar es que había una un conjunto de, de muchas malas prácticas que se llevaban a cabo. Entonces, ahí donde, donde tomo un poquito la decisión de conocer más, de aprender más acerca de, de todo este mundo y encontrar alternativas de cómo sumar para que esas malas prácticas empiecen a disminuir o a mermar. Pues son cosas así que uno va, va enfrentando con las abejas o con las personas, o más con las personas, porque el que... Es el principal reto que nos ha tocado aquí. Uno de los, de, los, de los retos más importantes que tiene, tenía y sigue teniendo la miel de melipona este, es eh, el, el mercado, ¿no? Un mercado que la conozca, que la valore. Empezar a preguntarnos qué tuvo que pasar para que llegara este frasquito a mí. 
cada frasco de miel cuenta una historia. Te habla sobre el territorio, te habla sobre el productor y entonces la diversidad se vuelve gigantesca, ¿no? Es infinita la variedad de mieles que, que pueden haber. Estamos haciendo un gran esfuerzo para sumar eh, o hacer equipo con productores en comunidades para garantizar condiciones justas de comercialización. Se trata de, de demostrar que sí se puede, que sí podemos cambiar la forma en la que hacemos los negocios Buscamos eh, espacios para compartir información, para contribuir a que más gente aprenda y se involucre y se adentre en el mundo de la miel, pero que se adentre de una manera informada. Saber uno quiere el diario. Y si traen algo para apoyarme, cuestión de conocimiento, para poder reforzar esto, pues qué padre, ¿no? qué, qué bonito. Sí vendemos miel, pero es mucho más que eso. Es un, es un proyecto para generar desarrollo en la comunidad para generar oportunidades para los productores. Creo que pues, si cada quien pone un poco y aporta desde su, sus posibilidades, está lográndose algo positivo. Sé que esto va a llegar en personas que, que a lo mejor no conocen la abeja o personas que lo quieran conocer. De eso se trata todo esto, de compartir las experiencias. Haciendo equipo con otras personas que también creen en, en estos procesos de comercialización justa, que también creen en procesos de transformación, pues llegamos a, a la construcción de este proyecto. Todas nuestras acciones están basadas en tres pilares. Aprender, porque no puedes proteger algo que no conoces. Contribuir, porque tú puedes contribuir con tus decisiones para generar cadenas de valor más justas. Y honrar, porque al hacer esto, honras el trabajo de todos los involucrados en la cadena de valor. Aprende, contribuye, honra. Okay, so that's a little bit of us. Um, that's my business partner, uh, Rodrigo. Rodrigo and I started this uh, project three years ago. Uh, he's a stingless bee keeper. And three years ago, uh, we started this project because we saw um, that the demand of stingless bee honey was going up in the peninsula, but with the demand going up, also did uh, some practices what, that, that were not very positive and that had a harmful impact in the people and the environment and, and the bees. So that's how we started. Um, so, Uh, before I start talking about what we do and a little bit more about bees, I would love if some of you could share with me something you know about bees. Anything. What, what I know about bees is they sting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's like one of the first things that comes to our mind, right? Bees sting. Yeah, because that's like one of our first interactions when we're little, at least one of my first interactions with bees when I was a child is being stung by a bee. And so it wasn't until we came to the Yucatan that I even heard of stingless bees. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about stingless bees either. Um, when I first came to the Yucatan, I started learning about them and I was like, what? This is like, this goes against everything uh, I've ever been told about bees. How about the rest? Don, Marilyn, Susan? Uh, I'm here with Don and uh, my grandfather had bees and made honey. And it was, uh, it was a really fun thing when he had a new bunch of uh, batch of honey um, in Oklahoma many years ago. Excellent. Did you ever get to try like the honey from the honeycomb and chewing on it? Oh, yes. That's what the kids got to do is chew on the honeycomb and the wax and uh, and put the honey on biscuits, which is quite delicious. Excellent. What's your name? My name's Marty. Marty? Uh -huh. Excellent. So you have very good memories. Uh, yes, with I do. Memories. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yes. Did you know about stingless bees? Uh, somebody said something. 
Yes, this is Aaron Shapiro with Susan Shapiro. And as Scott, we showed him about a week ago, we have uh, what we think are melopona bees in a hive, in, our, in a wall in our property here, just down the street, a few houses from the English Library in Merida. Okay, so yeah, you probably do have. That's actually very common. Um, thank you for sharing. I will talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and if uh, you send us a picture, I can tell you what species it is, and I'll be, um, if, if you're like happy with them being here, you can leave them there. If you want to move them, then you can also give us a call and um, we'll go and evaluate the situation and we can remove them from the wall. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay so um, usually when, when we think about bees, uh, most people think about, you know, the bee that looks like this. It's yellow and black. It stings us. It produces honey. Um, and they're very important for the planet, right? That's basically what we know about bees. Mm -hmm. But what would you think if I to tell you there's more than 20,000 species of bees around the world? 20,000. It will be absurd to think that one species represents all 20,000 of them, right? Mm -hmm. But we've done so. So from these 20,000 species of bees, scientists divide them in seven families so they can study them. Um, I'm going to divide, divide them in four groups. It's just easy to remember. <laughs> so the first group will be honeybees. Out of these 20,000 species, how many would you think are honeybees? Just give me a number. 10,000. So, okay, 50%. Anyone thinks differently? Some people say all of them. So when we think about bees, we usually think of bees, honey, right? They're mm -hmm. always related. Mm -hmm. Well, from these 20,000 bee species around the world, only seven, seven species are considered honeybees. Mm -hmm. Seven out of 20,000. So what do the other ones do? I know there's carpenter bees. <laughs> So this doesn't mean they're the only ones that produce honey, but they do produce honey in large quantities for us to take advantage of it. And so uh, the European bee or Italian honeybee is one of them. The African bee, the one we hear horror stories about, that's another honeybee. Okay, um, but that's one group. What about the rest? A second group uh, will be bumblebees. Are you familiar with bumblebees? These like fair little guys. You, uh, we don't have a lot of bumblebees in Mexico. They live in colder weathers. So in um, uh, United States, Canada, you have um, a lot of bumblebees. From these 20,000 bee species, uh, around 250 uh, bumblebees have been registered, okay? 250. So more, more bumblebees than honeybees. Mm -hmm. The third group, and this is the group I'm going to talk um, the most about today, is stingless bees. How many stingless bees do you think there are? One. I thought just one. <laughs> one? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so there's around 450 species of stingless bees. Uh, that have been registered around the world, huh. 150. Okay, but who's who here is good at math? Who can help us uh, do some basic math? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you the numbers. We said 450 stingless bees, 250 bumblebees, and seven honeybees. How many do we have? <laughs> I get 707. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, 707 out of 20,000. We still have a lot to go, right? And I said we're going to divide them in four groups. So where are the rest of the bees? 
Most bees, more than 95% of bees are actually solitary. This means they do not live in organized societies. They do not have a queen. They do not produce honey. So basically everything we think of when we think about bees doesn't apply to most of them, right? So uh, when I realized this and I was talking to Rodrigo and he started telling me, uh, all these species and start reading more and more about bees, we realized we talk a lot about bees and how important they're for the planet, right? You've heard this, you've seen this on social media, like without bees, there would be no life. If bees die, we have four years left. Einstein said the destiny of uh, the bees was uh, attached to our destiny, all these things. Um, but how can we protect something we really know nothing about? That's why uh, Rodrigo and I, some of the things we do is create these kind of spaces uh, to learn about bees. And uh, that's why we really appreciate this space uh, that uh, Medida English Library is giving us because we cannot protect something we know nothing about. So learning, it's um, the first thing we need to do. So these are honeybees. You've seen um, these honeybees. This is the bees we usually um, are familiar with. Here are some examples of bumblebees. You've probably seen uh, bumblebees like the one on the right, but what, what about blue bumblebees or red bumblebees or purple bumblebees? Um. Bees come in every single shape, size, color you can imagine. So you get blue, very big, like four centimeters of uh, big bees, very small bees. Um, you probably have these ones on your, on your house. I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Do you identify this um, bee? Does it look like the one you have in your house? Yes, it does look similar. Yeah, so that's a stingless bee we found here in Yucatan. Um, in Mexico, we have 46 registered species of stingless bees. In the Yucatan, we have 17 species. One of them is this little guy. Um, this is one of the bees that has adapted well to urban pressure. But since it's not finding the trees it usually nests in, it's building, um, they're building their homes inside of the walls of ours and also in sea words and any like little hole they can find. So you probably see them around Medida a lot, but most people don't identify them as bees because when they're flying, they look more like wasps. So people think they're gonna like hurt them, but they're actually stingless bees. Uh, fun fact about this bee, uh, they produce honey but very little, around a whole hive, around 100 to 200 milliliters of honey per year. So it's not a great honey producer, but it's a great resin collector. So it could be a great ally to get propolis from. Propolis um, comes from resins and is the best uh, antiseptic, antiviral in nature. So it could be a great um, ally for humans or, and for our health. Uh, but it's also a great pollinator. So it's very important for us to learn from these bees. If you do have one of these in your house and you can spot them, um, talk, uh, show them to every person who comes to your house. That's a great way of um, helping conservation because now people can identify them. Okay. Look at these like blue and black one. Um, These are leaf cutter bees on the bottom left. They build their nests with leaves. They're also solitary bees. Bees that bury themselves underground. Most bees actually build their nests underneath the ground, not on trees. <laughs> also solitary bees. This is a stingless bee from the Yucatan. Uh, she's pollinating a hibiscus flower here. And 
The big diversity of bees is correlated to the diversity of plants we have around the world. Uh, these um, flowers, you might know some of them, maybe don't recognize them. Maracuya on the bottom left, very beautiful flower. Agaves, um, oranges, achiote for cochinita pibil, um, coffee, vanilla. All these plants are pollinated by, by bees. Bees coevoluted with, with plants. So every single species of bee has a very intricate relationship to a certain uh, group of plants or specific plants. There's even bees that are codependent to one flower and the flower to the bees. If the flower dies, the bee disappears. If the bee disappears, the, the plant disappears as well. Uh, but there's bees that are less selective when pollinating and those are uh, honeybees. Stingless bees are selective when pollinating. Uh, that's why you can't move them around. You can't like, oh, I really like to work with bees and I learned about these stingless bees. I live in Ohio. I'm going <laughs> to take them back home and work with them there. No, sadly, you can't do that because these bees adapted to a certain weather, altitude, temperature, and especially uh, food, flowers from the region they're at. Some other examples of uh, bees. The one on the right, if you live in Merida, uh, you can actually see a few of these around uh, Merida, even in downtown. This green bee is called an Euglosa bee or an orchid bee. They're responsible of the pollination of orchids. Uh, most people mistake them with flies. They're actually bees. They fly super fast and tend to stop and suspend on the air. Uh, so uh, now that you know this is a bee, uh, mm -hmm. open your eyes, you'll probably see one of these around, especially in this time of the year. Uh, spring, there's a lot of pollen out there, so they're very active. So um, I hope with this little introduction about the what I call fascinating world of bees, mm -hmm. um, you understand when I say that when we talk about uh, bees and saving bees, we need to start changing the way we approach it. And we need to start talking about all these 20,000 species of bees. And not only the ones that are uh, important economically uh, for our society. Uh, all bees are important for the conservation of our planet. And uh, it's a very complex world, world, and we do need to start approaching it that way. Up to now, anyone has any questions and comments? No? Okay, so um, stingless bees. Who here, just to like know my public, who here has heard of stingless bees before or melipona bees or try their honey? Only yeah. since being here. <laughs> okay, since you got to many that. Just since we've seen them in our walk, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. you saw them and you were like, what is this? And somebody yeah. told you about stingless bees. Yes, that's all okay. I mean, a little bit. No. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so um, stingless bees. As I said, stingless bees, uh, there's more than 450 species. But we're in a very interesting part of the world regarding stingless bees because um, the Mayas were the first uh, group of people to start working with stingless bees. These were the bees uh, they had here. We didn't have the um, European bee that was a species that was introduced in the 17th century in the continent. So the Mayas were with stingless bees. Remember how many bee species uh, we have here in Yucatan? Stingless bees? 250. No, that's bumblebees. It's all right. Uh, 450 <laughs> around the world, uh, 17 stingless bees in the Yucatan. Um, from these 17 stingless bees, the Mayas knew all of them. We actually have Mayan names for each one of them, but they have a favorite one. 
And its name, its scientific name, it's Melipona Beche, or in Maya, Shunan Cap. If you're in Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula, and you hear about Melipona honey or Melipona bees, uh, usually people are referring to this species. But just know there's uh, 17 species in the Yucatan, but this is the one um, that people know the most about. And it's also the one that produces the most honey. Mm -hmm. um, the most honey means they produce two liters of honey max per year, a hive. That's not a lot of honey. Um, a hive from a European bee can produce from 40 to 60 kilograms of honey per year. So 60 kilograms versus two liters of honey, it's a huge difference. That's one of the reasons when the European bee was introduced in the continent, um, the work with stingless bees was put aside because they produce so like little honey compared to the European bee. But this Melipona beche bee, it actually looks quite similar to Apis mellifera, so the European bee. Is this one on the, on the top? Looks very similar, but it's actually smaller in size and um, it can sting you. So uh, plot twist, <laughs> stingless bees do have a stinger, but it doesn't work, so they can't use it. It evolved in a, it evolved in a certain way. It's um, stuck inside of their bodies and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so they can't sing you. That's a Melipona Beche, okay? So Shunan Cab or the Rogel Bee or the Lady Bee, some other names you'll hear for this uh, species. And this um, species, um, it's a, we know very little uh, from other species of bees. Uh, from the European bee, we know a lot. From the rest, we know very little. But what we know about um, stingless bees in the Yucatan, we actually know from this thing on the left. Have you seen this before or know, like, what could this be? The codices? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually one of the few codes uh, that were uh, left and found in, in Mesoamerica, and this was found in the Yucatan. It's a very interesting code. It's called the Trocortesiano code, or also the Madrid code. It's in the Museum of Madrid um, in Spain. And in this code, the Mayas talk about their sacred relationship to food. So every single uh, thing or person displayed here, it's either a god or a priest. In this code, um, the, the, a great part of the code talks about stingless bees and their relationship to the Mayas. Uh, for the Mayas, there were four gods that hold the universe in place. And um, one of them is Amusenkab. Gab means bee in Maya, and Amus and Gab, it's the Mayan god of the bees, one of them. And it's this little guy. Can you see it? Okay, so for me, it looks like a bunny, but for the Mayas, it's a bee. It's Amus and Gab. Imagine one out of four gods that holds the universe in place is a bee. That tells you a lot about the relationship and the importance the, the Mayas gave to the bees. Okay? So the Mayas start working with these stingless bees and then the knowledge spread to the north and the south of the continent. So now you have indigenous groups um, around Mexico that work with stingless bees and also to the south um, up to Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, um, lots of groups start working with stingless bees, but um, everyone works with a different species, the species they have in the place they live. So um, Melipona beche is the species out of the stingless bees that has been studied the most. Um, I told you the first, our first source of knowledge for these um, bee and the properties of their honey is the code. 
Another source of knowledge is the living knowledge in the communities. And of course, um, because of all the properties of the honey that I'm gonna to talk to you uh, about in a little bit, but because of all these properties that the scientific community is getting more and more interested in uh, learning about these bees and the honey they produce. Right? Um, this honey is produced in a very different way. Uh, it doesn't come on honeycombs like the ones you ate when you were little. They produce and store honey in these little wax balloons. So very different structure from a hive from a European bee. And the extraction nowadays is made with the syringe. So you have an idea, every, every one of these balloons has between 10 and 15 milliliters of honey. So imagine extracting a liter of honey like that. It's very labor intensive and um, it's, very, it's a very delicate process. Okay. This is how a traditional melee look like. So apiary for apis bees and meliponary for melipona bees. Um, these logs are the hives. So the, the hives build their nest inside of the trunks of trees. At Plaza Carmesí, we actually have um, one of these logs. It's empty because this species you cannot have in urban areas. Um, but we have a lot of pictures um, and a whole area talking about stingless bees, how the hives look inside, uh, how, how you can harvest it. Uh, so if you're curious enough or you're there, just like have a look. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, definitely, how this honey is produced. So these, if you also go to a community and you uh, go to a mediponary, uh, or you want to visit one, let us know. We can also arrange that for you. Uh, this is what you will see for traditional logs. But um, of course, to get one of these logs, you have to cut the trees, right? So, um, you can also find now stingless bees, melipona bees in boxes like this one. At Carmesí, we also have an example of, of one of these boxes. Uh, so we can reproduce the species for uh, economic purposes uh, and we don't have to cut the trees and uh, extract um, wild honeys from the wild. This is very important because um, let me run uh, you through what's happening in the melipona honey industry. Uh, even though honey, the honey industry has been around for a very long time, for stingless bees, it's very new. Even though the Mayas worked with them uh, like hundreds of years ago, uh, the interest, the, the interest in melipona bees and stingless bees um, stop because of the introduction of the other species and the knowledge almost disappeared until about 10 years ago that the, the demand of the honey started going up. Um, some people got interested about the honey uh, and the properties of the honey because they, will, they, they would hear of the benefits of this honey. So this honey, more than as a sweetener, it is sick for its medicinal properties. Uh, you will usually find it in drop because uh, in Mayan communities and in traditional Mayan medicine, the stingless bee honey is applied directly on the eyes to cure cataract, glaucoma, retinal detachment, eye infections like conjunctivitis. Uh, these might sound a little bit crazy but we actually know a lot of people that have avoided surgeries because of the use of the honey. They basically apply the honey every day in their eyes and after a month or two, depending on the, uh, how far they're on with the um, glaucoma, the whole thing just like comes off. So it's very impressive. Of course, a lot of people are getting interested in this honey because of the potentials um, used uh, for eye, eye diseases. Uh, another use for the honey, it's uh, to treat skin problems. 
uh, dermatitis, skin dryness, burns, skin wounds uh, to help wounds heal faster. People with diabetes that have problem healing wounds apply the honey to protect from infections because honey is an antibacterial for excellence and to accelerate the um, uh, regeneration of tissue. So uh, what scientists are discovering is that this honey has two very unique properties. One of them is that it gets rid of that tissue. And the other one is that it accelerates the regeneration, the regeneration of new tissue. That's why it um, helps with uh, uh, skin, skin problems. Okay. Um, these are some topic uses, uh, traditional uses. Of course, you can also consume it. Uh, Melipona honey has all the vitamins uh, bromatologists recommend for human life and uh, properties like um, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, uh, antibacterial, even anti-cancerogenous properties have been um, attributed to melipona honey. This doesn't mean if you consume melipona honey, it cures cancer, but all these properties does um, promote cellular function. And if your cells function better, your immune system works better as well. So it's a boost to your immune system. Uh, melipona honey, uh, it's used to treat um, anemia or malnutrition, um, like a superfood. And well, these are some of the properties. People with gastritis or ulcers uh, also consume the honey um, like in the mornings before having anything else because of this uh, property that regenerates tissue. It helps heal those wounds uh, from ulcers and gastritis. And uh, these are like traditional and medical uses. Um, the cosmetic industry is, of course, getting more and more interested in the honey to do face masks, face creams. Um, I say the raw product, it's always the best, so you can also apply it on the face. So all of these are like um, the uses people give to stingless bee honey. And uh, why uh, when they start um, being more and more known, the demand of the honey started going up a few years ago. Uh, this is a good thing because it presents us, at least this is the way Rodrigo and I see it, uh, it presents us an opportunity to generate income um, in small communities, a fair income. But of course, value chains are more and more complex than that, and we as consumers mold them. So uh, I would like to share with you some of the things that are happening with uh, melipona honey. Uh, discrimination of honey. So all these colors of honey are real colors of honey. Honey can come in every color, um, taste, smell, and texture you can imagine. So and organolectic properties of the honey are not an indicator of quality. What's happening right now, people try melipona honey for the first time they marry themselves to a certain flavor, texture, or color, and then they're starting to demand that it's always the same. And if you look around, uh, for me, honey is a reflection of nature. Um, every jar will tell you a story. Uh, it's the combination of millions of nectars from millions of different types of flowers. So every time it will be different. You cannot uh, make sure you're, um, having melipona honey just by the color texture flavor of it so um, you would do, have to do a chemical test to be 100 percent sure the price of the honey of course uh intermediaries uh, we call in mexico coyotes when they have bad practices start appearing and going to the communities that have no access to uh, market and pay very, very, very low prices for the honey. These, it's a, this is a social uh, problem, uh, an economic problem, but it's also an environmental problem because since, produce, since people are not getting paid uh, a fair amount for the work, they're not encouraged to learn more about sustainable practice and to protect the bees. So low prices paid to, uh, in communities 
uh, encourage the wild honey extraction and wild hive extractions, which leads to deforestation and the loss of um, honey, of um, bees, of stingless bees, and the loss of a pollinators, a certain pollinator in huge areas in the peninsula. Um, another problem that arises is um, when, when producers don't have the, the tools and the knowledge to work with these bees is the loss of genetics uh, because these bees reproduce in different ways that the European bees do. So every single species of bee reproduces in a different way. So if they don't have the knowledge, uh, genetic loss, uh, it's happening because, uh, the, because of the congregation of bees um, in one single place. So these are a lot of problems and we could go on and on that are not evident for the final consumer and they don't have to be. Uh, we don't all have to be experts and in the uh, value chain and know what's happening all along. Uh, but there is something we can do and not only regarding stingless bee honey, but also with all the products we consume or at least the products we consume the most. And this is um, doing some research and trying to buy from producers, companies, uh, brands that can guarantee the traceability of the products we consume. So at Miel Nativa, we guarantee that every bottle of uh, honey you buy, it's traceable to the producer. We can tell you who, when, where, and what for every bottle. Uh, this is a great way to, to fight uh, all of these issues that arise. Um, in value chain, especially uh, in products that are um, that come from agriculture, right? the, the products we consume. So, what's the difference when you said you could uh, chemically test to see if it's melipona honey? What is the chemical difference between that and, say, from a European bee? Okay, so that's a very good question. What is honey? Uh, bee vomit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't worry. I like to ask this question because I didn't know what honey was um, when I first started this um, company. And one day I realized we live in a world with so much access to food that we rarely stop to ask ourselves, where does it come from? What is it that I'm putting in my mouth? But basically honey is the result of a combination of the nectar from the plants that the bees collect and the bee saliva. Um, honey is not bee vomit. A lot of people think that because bees do absorb the nectar and then regurgitate, regurgitate it, but there's not a digestive process going on. It's just like a pocket they have inside of their bodies. Um, so uh, it's not bee vomit, but they do mix it, uh, put in their bodies and then spit it out and in that process the nectar is mixed with the bee saliva. Every single species of bee has different enzymes in their saliva. Enzymes are these proteins that start chemical reactions. So every mix of enzymes will start different chemical reactions. So the um, chemical structure of the honey from every single species of bee, it's different. Um, I can, if you go to our webpage, uh, we have a section there that says learn. In that learning section, we have information about uh, Melipona Beche honey, so honey from this particular stingless bee species, and like uh, what it has, what properties it has, why does it work, how can I use it, etc. Uh, but that's basically the, the main difference, the enzymes on the bee saliva. Mm -hmm. Also, as I said, uh, every single species of bee pollinates different species of plants and the nectar also changes. So stingless bees uh, from uh, the Yucatan pollinate trees and plants from the Yucatan and we have a lot of medicinal plants here. So uh, that also, of course, affects um, on the honey. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this is Rodrigo again and me. Um, when we started this company, we really wanted to um, to try to demonstrate that we can do business in a different way. Um, and we can put the planet and the people first. So uh, when we started these, we decided we would try that everything we did had three main things in mind. Um, the first one I've already said, it's to learn because we cannot protect something we know nothing about. And when we learn, we can actually transform that information into actions. Um, the second pillar is to contribute because we think we can all contribute to have a more fair and responsible uh, and sustainable planet uh, with the actions on our decisions every day. And the third one is to honor because when you learn and you translate that information, information into actions for preservation, into actions for uh, sustainability, um, you're actually honoring everyone involved in the value chains. Uh, so it doesn't have to be honey. It doesn't have to be bees. But I do encourage you that you choose something that you're passionate about and learn, contribute, and honor. So this is um, us. This is what we do. If you are um, interested in the topic, if you would like to try very like um, different honeys from different species of bees in the Yucatan, non-commercial honeys and learn about um, these other species of bees. We do honey tastings um, three times a week at Plaza Carmesí. We have uh, stingless bee hives there that you can see and learn uh, from. Uh, so, or just like come around, uh, anyone in the store can talk to you about uh, the honeys and what we do. Uh, I, we never wanted to like sell honey. <laughs> Selling honey is what we need to do. Uh, all the rest of things we do to work closely to the producers. And um, so we're trying to make our store more like a micro museum. So we have lots of different like fun things to see there. We have a, a bee, uh, bees from Yucatan are like real size so you can see huge bees small bees and now next week we're actually starting a bee um, expo from a photographer in Mexico that is doing a great job for bee conservation and taking pictures so you can learn about um, other species of bees all these pictures I showed you are from here so we're going to have these pictures displayed all around Plaza Carmesí so you can learn from different species of bees. Um, these pictures are for sale also because um, we're trying to help her um, pay for her trip to the desert. She's actually now in the desert um, photographing bees and following them around. She's going to be doing that for eight months. Wow. Uh, so it's a, a way for us to contribute to her work. And I think if um, that's all from, from me, but I would love to hear like your comments, questions, Just let me know. Well, <clears throat> could you talk briefly about the program that you have with Rodrigo to um, help people in small communities get started in the bee farm business? Yeah, sure. Um, so within the company, we have this project called Pase en Cadena, Chain Pass. This is a methodology. We It's not ours, but we copy it because it's very good. So what we do is as a company, we, we buy hives, a stingless bee hive from Melipona Beche. So you have an idea. It's between 5,500 pesos and 7,000 pesos, depending on the hive. So that's a lot of money for a producer or a person that wants to start producing stingless bee honey. So as a company, we buy hives or, um, or we get donations to buy hives. And we lend hives to a person or family that wants to start working with stingless bees. We accompany them for one year 
We teach them how to work with these bees, um, that we have a whole curricula uh, that we follow. Uh, and for example, we give them five hives. After one year from those five hives, five hives, they can reproduce like this. So from one hive, you can make two. And um, after one year, they give us our hives back. And now they have, for example, if I give them five at the end of the year, they might have eight new hives. So now, now they have eight hives for them to start uh, working with these uh, stingless bees. Um, they don't acquire any economic uh, compromise with us. So after a year, they can um, sell the hives if they need the money, they can keep reproducing and then sell hives. They can extract the honey and sell us the honey if they want. If they wanna sell it to somebody else, that's fine as well. Uh, if they wanna consume it for their house and their family, that's okay. It's a way of um, them in engaging with the bees and having an extra source of income or like a, a reservoir, like a saving. Some, some uh, of these people, if they have a, like a medical issue, uh, they can get in a lot of debt just because of, I don't know, like a very small problem. Mm -hmm. um, so they have the hives to like sell or sell the honey to um, be able to confront that. So it's, um, and it's a way um, of also encouraging the conservation of bees. We give them melipona bees Melipona Beche, so this commercial uh, bee, but we also encourage the reproduction of other species of bees mm -hmm. as, that are non-commercial for conservation purposes. They also um, uh, have to compromise to make a reforestation with native plants. So that way we guarantee we have the bees, but we also have the food for the bees. Um, so that's um, uh, some things we're doing. It's called Chain, chain Pass. Um, also, if you're interested in um, supporting, give us a call, uh, send us a text. Uh, you can contact us uh, through Instagram, uh, Facebook, our webpage. Um, um, send us an email or just um, uh, by phone. This, the one on the left is my phone number. The one on the right is Rodrigo's. Um, and if you're just like curious and want to keep talking about uh, bees and honey, that we would love you to give us a call. So now I've only I've tasted the Malapuna bee honey. Is it always thinner than the European bee honey? It tends to have a higher water content. Okay. So yes, it tends to be thinner, but depending on the harvest, sometimes it's a bit thicker. Uh, and sometimes melipona honey tends to be on like the acid tingy side, but sometimes you have a melipona honey that's super sweet, super sweet. Um, so that's why you can't really know if it's melipona honey just by the texture or the flavor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so has most of the knowledge about the medicinal purposes been passed on or through the Maya and the codices? And then as a result, studies have been performed to confirm the medicinal purposes? Or are you finding new medicinal purposes? So it, this is very new. So uh, there's articles and um, research being uh, done every every day. We have to be uh, reading um, all the time and uh, learning more. And as the scientific community uh, researches and starts like learning more about the honey, uh, also does the traditional knowledge starts like awakening again in a way. Mm -hmm. So as we're talking more and more about stingless bees, um, the elder people in the communities are talking more about it as well. And so uh, the new generations are starting to, to learn about these, um, uh, about the traditional knowledge. Because the thing with traditional knowledge, it's so, 
delicate, it can be lost in one generation. Uh, if one generation doesn't pass the knowledge to the other, it can be lost. So when we go to communities and young people start getting more and more interested in learning and having stingless bees as a source of income, um, the elders start talking about like what they knew, what they did when they were younger. And like uh, this helps with um, promoting traditional knowledge. So I think they go hand in hand. Like we're learning from both sides still today. And I, I think it will be like this for the uh, few years to come. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question. This is Rebecca. This is a wonderfully informative talk. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm actually in the States right now, but I was in Merida previously. And last week I happened to be in your shop and I bought a little bottle of the Propolio mm -hmm. de Melipona. And I'm not sure why it just was intriguing to me. So I'm not exactly sure what to do with it. Can you, I mean, I understand the directions. It says to put 20 to 25 drops in a medium glass of water, but do I do that if I'm not feeling well or do you do it on a regular basis? Hi, Becca, thank you. Hi. Yeah, so you can uh, properly, it, uh, you can use it as a pre preventive. Um, so I, I have it uh, once a week, like okay. 20 drops in a glass of water. If you start feeling like you might get sick, like your throat feels funny, uh, you can do it three times, like as soon as you start feeling uh, like that, three times a day, like morning, afternoon, uh, night. Uh -huh. That will help a lot. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to try it. It was a lovely shop. I also bought soap to bring back as gifts. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for supporting us. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you to the to Mel for doing this talk too. I'm glad to hear like I, I thought everyone was in many that, so it's great. Yeah. <laughs> You hear that you're not here yet, but you'll come back. <laughs> but I'll be back. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, thank you. Uh, the you mentioned the difficulty that the producers sometimes have in getting a fair price for their product, and one of the ways you're trying to fight that is by allowing the producers, more producers, an easy way to get into the market. Uh, what do you think a fair price would be for, let's say, a liter of honey that a producer should be able to get for their work? So it varies um, a little bit here in Yucatan. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about Melipona beche, okay? Because in Mexico, if you go to Oaxaca, they have another species there that's being commercialized, and in Veracruz, another one. But here in Yucatan, um, depending on the year and the season, because we've had very hard seasons, like a couple of years ago with all the rains. Uh, so it fluctuates a little bit, but for a liter of, uh, of Melipona honey, it goes from 2000 to 2600 pesos uh, per liter. Now it's gonna keep going up because the demand is going faster than the uh, production. Um, but yeah, that will be for, we, we sell um, a granel on bulk. Uh, the, the price right now it's 2,200 um, uh, pesos per liter. Okay. And you said a, a typical hive produces about two liters per year. So if you had a hive that was, let's say five years old and never been harvested, do you think it would have perhaps 10 liters in it or does it? No, so a, a, a strong mother hive in a good year can produce up to two liters. Uh, a sustainable practice um, means we only harvest 40 to 50%, so a liter from that hive. Um, if you don't harvest a hive for like 10 years, what the bees will do is they will um, divide themselves naturally and go and keep growing instead of like harvesting more. So they will, they will um, stay in that like 
two liter, three liter maybe uh, range because that's why a strong hive needs. So you have an idea uh, and a hive for your PNB has a strong hive, 60,000 individuals. A hive for a stingless bee, Melipona Beche, has uh, a strong hive, 3,000 individuals. So they won't go higher than that. They will just like divide and do something else. And they, they won't accumulate more honey what, than what they need. Mm -hmm. they, they're not like us. <laughs> so they just produce and accumulate what they need, yeah. Yeah, I thought Aaron with his hive that hasn't been touched in five years might be sitting on a gold mine with, you know, no. 20 liters of honey behind that wall, <laughs> but no. And with that species that produces so little, this is the, that species is actually a very interesting species. It's the species the Mayas used to do ceremonial drinks. Mm. It was very, very venerated uh, by Che, uh, uh, traditional like ritual drink uh, made with the uh, balche tree bark uh, and honey was actually made with honey from this species. A lot of people think it was made with um, singles bee honey from Melipona Beche, but no, it was made with, uh, they call it sac chic, the white winged bee because the tip of their wing is um, white. Uh, and it, it's a whole like ritual process. They kill 13 bees um, before they extract the honey and it's like a there's a there's a very complex cultural construction about uh, bees um, and, the, and the indigenous groups here the Mayas but other groups as well but it's it's not 100% lost but I would say it's hidden in the small communities um, with certain people and it's it's hard to um, uh, be in contact with it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's very interesting. It's very interesting. But if somebody comes up to the street, comes up to me on the street and offers to sell me a bottle of Melipona bee honey, there's probably no way I can tell by looking at it whether it is really Melipona or not. No, and I've had this question like asked, and it it's on it will be unfair for me to tell you uh, you you can't know, so like don't trust them because maybe it is a producer that's like trying to sell it and yeah uh, but we've had experiences with people in Medida downtown selling that. And we ask a couple of questions uh, about like where the honey comes from and the production. And you, I mean, we can tell like that if they're lying or if they, maybe it is Melipona honey, but they have no idea where it came from, which is not the best practice. So it's very delicate. Yes, I understand. So I couldn't say, yeah, it, it's not going to be, or it is going to be, we don't know. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. Any other um, questions? Well, I would just like to say a few things. One, we would like to get in touch at some point. We'll, we're only going to be here for a short while longer, but we'll be back in October or November for, the, you know, we're here five months a year, easily, or six. So we would like to get in touch and have someone, if you're, if someone was interested, to visit and and see what we have here in our wall. That would be kind of interesting for us and maybe for someone like yourself. And then the other thing is we we've been rather curious about uh, watching the behavior. There are times when there seems to be lots of activity in and out of the hive, and there are times when there's not much, and there's also times when they appear to elongate the tubular entrance uh, upwards of uh, two or three, oh, let me say inches. Uh, so about uh, five, five centimeters even, uh, you know, uh, outside the wall. And then after some sort of event will occur, that tube will no longer be there. And they'll be back kind of to the surface of the wall. 
those things we've observed over time. There also seem to be like, uh, in our imaginations anyway, what we would call uh, guard bees, you know, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Hanging out at the entrance, maybe controlling the exit or entrance of their comrades. These are just things we've observed and knowing nothing. We know nothing. Yeah. I, I love that you're sharing this and that you observe so much of their activity. And from what you're saying, you probably have another species called Yash Ich in Maya, the green eye bee. They're very small, tiny. Yes, they're very small. Um, Yes. And yeah, stingless bees, since they don't have a stinger uh, or they can't sting or defend themselves that way, they're ultra social and they have very interesting ways of defending themselves. And they always have a guardian on the door. Depending on the species, they have either one guardian or many guardians. Uh, those like tiny bees you see always like around the entrance, those are guardians. They're in charge of making sure nobody comes in without permission or a bee from another hive or a, a thread. Um, the, the activity varies depending on the weather, the time of the year, how strong the hive is. Sometimes you won't see a lot of activity. Um, that might uh, tell us there's something wrong going um, inside, like uh, a fly came in and they're like trying to fight it, uh, things like this. Um, if you sometimes you'll see huge numbers of bees flying outside, like they make these like huge clouds, uh, that might tell you they're um, reproducing. Uh, so uh, princes went out and they're waiting to uh, for the mail like that could um, be that um, the the entrance the tube it's made out of wax um, if if you have this piece i'm thinking of um, they close it at night the entrance and uh, when the sun rises they open it have you noticed that yes yeah, so it's yash, you probably have a yash each. It's called Nanotrigona perilampoides. That's the scientific name. And this is a species of bee. They produce like 100 to 200 milliliters of honey per year. This is one of the honeys we actually have in the honey tasting um, that you can try. And we sometimes have it. Um, and uh, these BC does that like tubular entrance and they can elongate it and shorten it. Uh, some, usually the longer it is, the stronger the hive is. It's not a rule, but usually if the hive is very strong and has been there for a very long while, then you, you have a very prominent entrance. And those tubes um, continue in the inside. And they are packed with uh, resins, uh, with propolis. So they work like as a disinfectant. Like, like the bees come in and they get disinfected with viruses and bacteria because of the propolis from the resins. So they have this function. It also, they're like twisted and like that because uh, it makes it harder for a plague to come in because they have to twist and turn and yeah we'll be happy to go check it out and let you know what species it is and we're a couple of blocks away so um that's my if, if you're wondering the week just give me a call or send me a text and i'll be happy to, to go check it out and tell you a bit of fun facts about these um, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful thank you very much yeah, yeah. no problem and could you give us the days and times of the uh, honey tasting? Yeah, so um, we're doing the honey tastings on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, we just changed the time. So we're doing it now from 5 p.m. to 7. They're usually two hours long. Um, there are 350 pesos. Uh, you do have to make a reservation in advance. You can make them uh, make the reservation directly on uh, plastic with one of the girls from the store and on Saturdays we're having them from 10 a.m. to 12. Okay. 
I also uh, make the pitch that we watched the Netflix series Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, and the acid uh, episode of that series takes place in Yucatan, and you guys are in that briefly. Yeah, so uh, we filmed that uh, like five years ago. A fun fact is that when we filmed that, we didn't even have like the company or didn't even think about starting this company mm -hmm. uh, but we were both working with um, communities and i was doing um, gastronomic tourism experiences and rodrigo was a honey expert so um, we ended up there and yeah now here we are <laughs> all right any other questions well, as has been said, this has been very informative. I've learned a lot and I appreciate you taking the time for us. You can all see the uh, contact information there on your screen or the Plaza Carmisi at CAI 53 and 62. And with that, we'll call it an evening. Thanks again, Andrea. It's been great. Really appreciate Thank you being here. Thank you everyone uh, for being here and for your time. Thanks so much. Thank you.